committee of this meeting for the invitation. And then I would like also to thank uh, Dr. Natalie Turner, who is a clinical research fellow in our institution, who has helped me in preparing this uh, lecture today. This is my disclosure slide. And this is going to be my first slide. So you can see here, I'm going to focus uh, on uh, the last uh, EBCTCG overview on polychemotherapy. As you know, the results of this uh, analysis were fully reported in the Lancet last year. And the questions that are addressed in the overview are basically three. Uh, role of taxanes plus anthracyclines versus anthracyclines, role of anthracyclines versus CMF, a role of polychemotherapy versus no chemotherapy. Overall, uh, more than 100,000 women have been analyzed in this overview and have been entered in 123 randomized trials run internationally. Here I report briefly the results of the taxane trials. Uh, you see that we have two different group of trials. At your right, you, at your left, sorry, you see the trials that have been uh, uh, comparing uh, in most of the cases four cycles of anthracyclines versus four cycles of the same regimen followed by taxanes. And at your right, uh, you see uh, the other group of trials, the second generation trials. Uh, the difference between the first and the second generation trials has been that in the second generation trials, the control arm consisted of a more intensive anthracyclin based chemotherapy. And when you look at the results, here I present the breast cancer mortality data, but basically results are very similar if you look at the overall survival data or the uh, recurrence-free survival data, you can see that uh, the taxane-based chemotherapy is more active than the anthracyclin-based chemotherapy. Uh, and we have also the impression that the superiority of taxanes is particularly relevant uh, in the first generation trials where we had less anthracycline based chemotherapy in the control arm than in the uh, second generation trials. Here we have a subgroup analysis performed in the context of these taxane trials. Uh, the aim of the analysis was to understand if there was any specific factor that was uh, interacting with the activity of taxanes in the adjuvant setting. I will not go into the details of this forest plot, but the bottom line message here is that uh, uh, taxanes show superiority over anthracyclines in all the different subgroups that have been analyzed, including also uh, the estrogen receptor status of the primary tumor. These are uh, the uh, main results of the anthracyclines versus CMF trials. Uh, you can see at your right uh, uh, the first generation trials that we are comparing uh, uh, CMF with uh, a less intensive anthracycline based chemotherapy such as uh, four cycles of AC. And uh, then uh, at your left, uh, you see the second generation trials uh, where a more intensive anthracycline based chemo has been compared with uh, standard CMF. And here the message is that if you use a more intensive anthracycline based chemotherapy, you have better results than standard CMF. Subgroup analysis for us plots here for the anthracycline versus CMF trials. And uh, once again, without going into the details of the analysis, but the message here is that uh, there is no uh, any specific subgroup uh, in which uh, we do not see the superiority of anthracyclines over CMF. All patients derive uh, increased benefit from anthracyclines uh, over CMF. Third group of studies, the studies that have been comparing polychemotherapy versus no polychemotherapy, at your right, you see the trials where CMF has been the polychemotherapy treatment, and uh, at your left, you see the trials where anthracyclines uh, have been uh, the polychemotherapy uh, treatment. There is substantially no difference between the two different groups of trials. Polychemotherapy shows to be better than no polychemotherapy. And once again, no interaction with any subgroup 
the superiority of polychemotherapy is seen in all the different subgroups analyzed in the context of this specific analysis. Now, these are, in summary, the results of the 2012 uh, uh, overview that has been reported in The Lancet. And now the question for practicing clinicians is how much these results are helpful in driving uh, our treatment decisions for daily practice? How much these uh, um, results can assist us in uh, taking the right uh, decision for each individual patient? And I think actually here we are facing three different issues that have to be addressed. Uh, one is the clinical heterogeneity of the ER positive disease. The second one is the well-known uh, uh, action of chemotherapy that tends to induce endocrine effects in patients aged less than 55. And in the cohort of ER-positive tumors, these endocrine effects may have clinical relevance. And the third issue is how much the population evaluated in the overview is a representative of the population that we see in our daily practice. So I will try to address these three different questions in the rest of my presentation. Let's start with the concept of estrogen receptor heterogeneity that is a very well-known concept since at least 10, 15 years. There are many papers that have been reported in the literature focusing on this issue. On this issue. Here I present three of these studies. Uh, you can see at, at in the upper left part of the slide uh, that uh, we have a series of patients we did not receive any adjuvant therapy, and these patients actually have been classified according to the PAM50 signature, and you may observe that the clinical behavior of uh, luminal A tumors uh, is uh, substantially different from the clinical behavior of luminal B tumors, despite the fact that the two groups are characterized by the expression of the estrogen receptor. In another study reported by the NSABP group, reported in the upper right part of, this, of the slide, uh, you can see another series of early breast cancer patients, no negative, ER positive patients, all treated with adjuvant tamoxifen. And you can see uh, if you classify patients by the Oncotype DX recurrence score, you see that the prognosis of these patients is substantially different despite the fact that they have all been treated with adjuvant tamoxifen. And finally, even if you use uh, immunohistochemistry to assess the standard biomarkers on the primary tumor, once again, you can identify the luminal A-like and luminal B-like tumors, and you can see that the clinical outcome of these two groups is substantially different. So it is quite clear that if you look at the literature, of the last 10, 15 years, we are dealing with a substantial clinical and biological heterogeneity of the ER-positive population. Now, let me go to the other uh, issue that I've been presenting in my previous slide, and this is the issue of the endocrine effects played by chemotherapy in uh, ER-positive patients uh, with a premenopausal status. In this slide, I have been analyzing the 46 trials which are part of the overview and which are focusing on the role of polychemotherapy versus no polychemotherapy in premenopausal patients with ER positive tumors. And you can see uh, I have been focusing specifically on the analysis of the control arm of these 46 trials. And you can see here that in the majority of these trials, almost 70%, the control arm did not have any adjuvant uh, uh, systemic therapy. So the design of these trials was polychemotherapy versus no systemic therapy. Then we have a minority of trials, approximately 20%, where the control arm has been uh, uh, tamoxifen uh, in most of the cases for less than five years. So the design of this uh, second group of trials was tamoxifen, alone versus chemotherapy followed by tamoxifen for less than five years. 
Finally, we have just a few trials where the control arm has been ovarian suppression. And last but not least, we have four trials, four out of 46, where the control arm has been complete estrogen blockade. So the bottom line message of this slide, in my opinion, is that uh, in the vast majority of trials that have been analyzed in the overview, specifically for the premenopausal patients with ER positive tumors, uh, the endocrine therapy that has been given in the control arm is uh, nowadays defined suboptimal. And so the question is, uh, in this specific context, the advantage that we see with chemotherapy in these trials, how much of this advantage is related to the cytotoxicity of chemotherapy and how much of this advantage is related to the endocrine effects of chemotherapy on the ovarian function. And unfortunately, it's not possible to address this question in the context of the overview. So let me summarize in this slide the first two issues that have been presented today. The overview does not take into account the biological and clinical heterogeneity of ER-positive tumors and results reported for the population of ER-positive patients aged less than 55 may at least in part be related to the ovarian function suppression induced by chemotherapy and they may tend to overestimate benefits deriving from uh, chemotherapy cytotoxicity. Now let me move to the third uh, issue uh, that I would like to discuss today and uh, this issue is uh, related to the representativity of the overview population. How much patients from the overview population are representative of the patients that we see in our daily practice? Well, in this slide, you can see uh, the three bars at your right reporting the proportion of node positivity in the three different categories of trials uh, analyzed in the overview. The red bar is the rate of node positive disease in the taxane trials. The turquoise bar is the rate of node positive disease uh, in the anthracyclines versus CMF trials. And finally, the violet bar is the rate of node positive disease in the trials evaluating polychemotherapy versus not. And uh, when you compare the rate of node positive disease in these trials with the rate of node positive disease that we currently see in our daily practice, the green bar is what we see in, in my institution in Prato, and the yellow bar is the rate of node positive disease that we see in Tuscan, in the Tuscany region, you can realize immediately that the population that we are seeing nowadays is mainly characterized by node negative and not by node positive disease, as it was the case in the overview results. Let me analyze another factor, that is the rate of luminal A tumors in the overview results and in our institution as well as in Tuscany. Unfortunately, I don't have the rate of luminal A tumors in the overview results because we are missing some biomarker information that would allow us to define the rate of luminal A tumors in the Oxford overview, but at least I know the rate of ER positive disease in the Oxford overview for the three different categories of trials. Taxane versus anthracyclines, anthracyclines versus CMF, chemotherapy versus no chemotherapy. And then I, I know the rate of luminal A-like disease in my institution, that is around 50%, and in the Tuscany region for screening detected cases, that once again is around 50%. Now, even if you assume that uh, 50 to 60% of the ER positive patients from the Oxford overview have luminal A tumors, considering the rate of ER positivity in the Oxford overview, finally, the rate of luminal A tumors in the Oxford overview will be in the range of 25 to 40%. That is less than the rate of luminal A disease that we see in our daily practice. Let me summarize all this in just one single slide. So finally, the rate of node positive disease is higher in the Oxford overview than in current practice. The rate of luminal A tumors seems to be higher in current practice than in the overview, which is the consequence of all this. Well, if on average the population of the Oxford overview has an increased risk of disease relapse, uh, and in addition, uh, uh, on average, uh, the uh, rate of luminal A tumors is higher in uh, the 
current practice population than in the Oxford overview, the consequence is that uh, we uh, think that the absolute benefits seen with chemotherapy in the uh, overview on average are higher than the absolute benefits that we would expect with the same treatments in our daily practice. So in a few words, the impression is that the population that has been analyzed in the overview and that comes from trials run in the last 30 years is not entirely representative of the population that we are seeing in our daily practice and that the benefit that we see with uh, adjuvant chemotherapy in the overview is most likely uh, overestimating the ben benefit from chemotherapy if we apply the same type of treatment in our daily practice population. In my last few slides, I would like to focus uh, on uh, what I think uh, is the present and what I think is going to be the future regarding uh, adjuvant therapy of breast cancer. Well, the present is that currently we are uh, defining the risk of uh, disease uh, relapse by looking at the tumor and by looking at the axillary nodes. In addition, we are looking at the biology of the primary tumor to define the level of responsiveness to adjuvant therapies. What I think is going to be the future? Well, for the future, I think that we will continue to look at the biology of the primary tumor to define the level of responsiveness to adjuvant therapy, but I think that we need a radical change in the way we define the risk of disease relapse, and probably the best way to define in the future the risk of disease relapse will not be looking at the tumor, but it will be looking at the host and looking at the circulation where you can find markers that relate to the presence of micrometastatic disease. Because for the moment, we are defining the risk by assuming that the bad prognostic factors that you find in the primary tumor are going to be responsible of the presence of micrometastatic disease. But this is not necessarily true. And I would like to show you data that you know very well and that I would like to bring to your attention. These are the well-known uh, adjuvant studies run by Dr. Bonadon and colleagues in Milan many years ago. Very clear design, chemotherapy versus no adjuvant systemic therapy. The first study for no positive patients, the second study for no negative ER negative patients. And when you look at the results of these trials, it's surprising to see that at 30, almost 30 years of median follow-up, you have approximately a quarter of patients who did not receive any adjuvant therapy and who is still disease-free. And if you look at the no negative ER negative trial, you see that there are approximately 40% of these patients who are disease-free after 20 years of median follow-up, despite the fact that they did not receive any adjuvant therapy. And that if you think that with the new technologies you can do better in defining the risk, I'm afraid that we might be wrong. Look at this data that you know very well from the NACBP group, the no negative trial for ER positive patients. Patients divided in three groups according to the Oncotype DX score. Let's focus for one moment on the high risk group. Uh, half of these patients were treated just with adjuvant tamoxifen, and despite this, uh, almost 60% uh, of these patients are disease-free at 10 years of follow-up. Same findings in the study reported by Cathy Alban and colleagues from the ZUO group, where you can see that in the high-risk group, approximately 50% of patients are disease-free, despite the fact that they have been treated with adjuvant tamoxifen. So the bottom line message here, I think, is that we are overestimating the risk of disease relapse in our patients. We have done a lot of efforts in the last decade to identify markers to predict sensitivity to systemic therapies, but I think we need really to improve the way we define the risk of disease relapse in our early breast cancer patients. So I will stop here. I have just one my last slide in which I I uh, enjoyed in making a parallel between the last 300 years of art and the last 30 years of breast cancer research. Uh, this is a, a nice, uh, beautiful painting by William Turner, who was a British artist working uh, in between the 18th and the 19th century. Actually, he was a revolutionary artist because, as you can see from the picture, although the quality is not so good, there is a landscape, but the landscape is very abstract, and you see mainly some fields of color. 
uh, he was a master. Actually, all the artists who came after William Turner were inspired by his art in producing their own art. And uh, I think that the parallel of William Turner is with the forest plots from the Oxford overview. Uh, these data were very important in 85 when we, saw, when we were missing this type of information. We were dealing with small trials and we were looking for small but clinically relevant benefits from adjuvant therapies. The overview had certainly the merit to pull together all the trials and to demonstrate the activity of systemic therapies. The evolution after Turner has been Mark Rochko an artist that I like very much from New York, who has been living in New York in the 20th century. He was a leader of abstract expressionism. And actually here, there is no landscape. There is just a field of color. This is the evolution of the William Turner work. And I think that the evolution in terms of breast cancer research is a gene expression profiles. There is still a fil rouge with the uh, Oxford overview. And the fil rouge is that we certainly need to develop clinical trials to test the activity of adjuvant systemic therapies. But the way we should develop these trials is completely different. We should personalize the treatment based on the heterogeneity of breast cancer that unfortunately cannot be taken into account in the overview. Well, the evolution of Mark Rothko is a young British artist, David Batchelor. Uh, David Bachelor is still dealing with the color. You can see the field of colors here, but now the colors are in a canvas and the canvas is a part of an industrial trolley. And as you can see, these uh, industrial trolleys are combined together and are standing uh, in the middle of a nice exhibition room at the Tate Gallery. It's a revolution if you think to what has been done by William Turner and by Mark Rothko. And this is actually what uh, I think is the future of adjuvant therapy of breast cancer. We should take into account three different sources of information. One, to define responsiveness to adjuvant therapy, and this is the biology of the tumor, and the other two, to define the risk of disease relapse, and this is the host and the micromets. So I think that if we wanted to have for the future a contemporary overview, we need really to take into account the information that is coming from the last 15 years of breast cancer research. Otherwise, the risk is that the overview is going to be sort of a William Turner pa painting. Beautiful, very classic, a lot of tradition, but with modest, with modest impact on daily practice. Thank you very much for your attention.